catechesis is really an art. That is, it's, it's not an exact science, but we use methods to try to have a good pedagogy of faith, a way of teaching kids the faith, uh, but also our methods have to be comprehensive, helping kids to meet Jesus, to learn to pray, and to live the faith. back with the Art of Catechesis, uh, and we're focused today on catechetical methods. And you may be thinking, well, why didn't we get right to that? Uh, and we've really been trying to lay the foundation with everything that we've been talking about for how to do catechesis effectively today, uh, given the situation in our culture and where we're at with the church right now. And so this may be the heart of what we're talking about, that is, how to teach catechesis effectively, but really the entire series is focused on the art of catechesis, right? This way of bringing people into contact with Jesus. Uh, so we're just going to be looking at a few elements of our methodology uh, today, and particularly for the way in which the church has taught us to try to bring people to faith. And our Lexio is looking at Luke's gospel once again, and specifically uh, where Jesus sends out his disciples to be uh, the ones who are bringing people to him and to be preaching the kingdom and, and healing. Uh, but we also see uh, Jesus himself uh, caring for the people um, and showing them what it means to be his disciple. Uh, this is actually immediately following a parallel passage in Luke to the one that we read in Mark, uh, where Jesus healed the, the woman who was bleeding and raised the girl from the dead. So we can see that, you know, Jesus is encountering people, and then he is telling his disciples, and, and hopefully we are his disciples, right, that, that we need to go out and help other people to encounter him as well. So that's what we're going to be focused on, bringing people to faith, through an encounter with Jesus. So we'll begin at the beginning of Luke 9. So I'm going to read just the opening verses there. I'm going to skip over a few verses. So as you're following along, you should be able to see just a few verses that I skip over. We're not going to go all the way to the end of this chapter, but we'll really get the, the heart of it. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. Uh, what's, what stands out to me immediately here is that Jesus is both uh, giving us power to remove obstacles, right? We're giving them power over demons, right? It's not that we're going to be doing exorcisms, right? If we think that that's necessary, we should be referring people to the pastor. But nonetheless, we should be removing obstacles and helping people to say no to any evil influences in their life, to, to just remove that blockage out of the way, and then leading people more positively in to accept the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is the presence of Jesus, right? He is that kingdom that makes the Father present to us. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics, and whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever you do not, and wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Just another comment here. Uh, you know, we probably are not embracing poverty in our mission for catechesis. But what we do want to have that's similar is an absolute trust in Jesus. This is his mission, and we are doing this on his behalf. And so we recognize that it's not our efforts that are really doing it. And so there is a kind of poverty 
at least, and just letting go and saying, I'm here to serve. I trust that Jesus will be working through me. Uh, you know, training helps, but it's not just the training. It's not just my experience. It's the presence of God, which we hope will heal people, right? We, we all have uh, needs to be healed, uh, to be touched by God. And so we're bringing people to Jesus to experience that healing in a spiritual way. And sometimes when that spiritual healing happens, it, it opens up the person to healing even more broadly. Okay, so we're going to skip a few verses here. On their return, the apostles told him what they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Uh, and I think that the idea is that when we come to Jesus, we will be changed. We will be transformed uh, and healed uh, when we bring our lives and, and present them before him. We want to help people to do that. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the villages and country round about, to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a lonely place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. I, I, I love that, right? I mean, people have so many needs. People are going to be coming to us, you know, in their brokenness. And, you know, we can't fix everybody's problems, but, but Jesus can. And he's saying, here, take care of these people that come to you. Don't just send them off, to, you know, to somebody else. But you give them something to eat. And I think like the disciples were like, oh, well, Jesus, what do we have to give them? And we have something, right? And so we present what we have before the Lord. And we let him work through that. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in companies, about 50 each. And they did so, and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, and blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were satisfied. And they took up what was left over, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Right? And so we do uh, bring people in their particular groups. Right? We can't help everybody. We help people in their smaller groups that come to us. Uh, we give them what we can, but ultimately it is Jesus who feeds them. And this is Eucharistic language here, where he broke the bread and, and gave it to them. Ultimately, we want to bring people to Jesus in the Mass, through the Eucharist, to be fed for their deepest needs. We also, as I mentioned before, you know, we can literally also eat with people. And a lot of effective catechesis and discipleship happens over meals or sharing food together in a way that becomes even an extension of uh, the Eucharistic meal and sacrifice. Now, it happened that as he was praying, alone the disciples were with him. He was praying alone. The disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others that one of the prophets, old prophets, has risen. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? That is the crucial question, uh, which, it, which Jesus asked to us. And it will be asked to everyone who comes to us for catechesis as well. That's the one thing that really matters, coming to faith in Jesus, seeing Jesus and saying, yes, I believe that you are the Christ, right? That's what Peter says. Peter answered, the Christ of God. But he charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, right, essentially that we need to share in what's happening to Jesus. So that's our salvation, that Jesus, the Son of God, will be crucified. He was crucified. He rose from the dead. But we need to accept that with our faith, but also by sharing in his cross. And so he said to all, 
If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. And what, pro- what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and, and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. And so this is the crucial thing, to meet Jesus, to come to faith in Jesus and accept his will for us to follow him. This is what taking up our cross means, to follow Jesus, to live like him, to give him our life. Uh, And through that process, to be with him forever in glory and heaven. This is what we aim at in catechesis. This is our goal um, to have people to be healed in their encounter with Jesus, to become his follower, his disciple, to trust in him, that we trust in him, we want others to trust in him and not worry and have this anxiety uh, about earthly concerns, but to be fed by Jesus, to be fed in the Eucharist, but to be fed in all of our needs, um, to be his disciple, right? This is the goal, to be his disciple so that we can gain not earthly success and happiness, but to gain what matters most, eternal happiness with God. So we're going to take a a break once again here uh, for you to read this passage um, yourself in silence and to pray through it, uh, and then to discuss uh, with others anything um, that struck you uh, in the passage. When we think about our catechetical method, the church has actually proposed something uh, for us to be our model. The general directory of catechesis Uh, mentions a couple of times that the baptismal catechumenate is the model for all catechesis. So the baptismal catechumenate, if you remember back to our history of catechesis, our brief overview, is the process that the church developed for forming converts uh, in the ancient world. So when people came to the church, this was the process that they were led through to be initiated and to enter into the church. I want to connect this also to the divine pedagogy because I think there there is a strong connection between them. So we can think of it this way. The divine pedagogy is the way that God taught us in the Bible. The baptismal catechumenate is the way that the church has taught based on the way that God has taught. So the baptismal catechumenate expresses the divine pedagogy and then that becomes the model for our own teaching of catechesis. Uh, Why? Uh, Because it does model God's teaching for us, and it shows us a couple of things that are important to keep in mind. One is that catechesis, like the divine pedagogy, is progressive. It's done in stages. And we have to be aware of the group that we're working with and what their needs are. And so when we look at the different stages of the catechumenate, it's ordered towards different needs uh, of the different stages of growth in the spiritual life. Everyone needs to grow, right? Everyone needs to be deepened. And so no matter what group we're working with, the principles of the catechumenate can apply to what we're doing. The catechumenate also is based on a process of conversion. Right? Each step has its own unique conversion that it aims at, and we continue to deepen our faith. The Catholic faith is never once and done. To say, well, I said yes to God, or I decided I'm going to go to Mass on Sunday, so I'm good. No, what we see is the catechumenate, especially how it ends in mystagogy, shows us that there's a constant process for growing in our relationship with God. The catechumenate uh, is also liturgical. Each of these stages is accompanied by prayer and ritual. And so catechesis 
has to have this connection to prayer, to the Mass and the other sacraments. Uh, but some of these uh, prayers that we see, the rituals of the catechumenate, are also ordered towards exorcisms um, and also a proclamation of the word, something similar to the lexios that we've been doing. And so we have to have a liturgical dimension, a biblical dimension, and also a dimension of being healed of any obstacles that stand in the way of catechesis. We also see that the catechumenate is a process of mentorship. So when you're going through the catechumenate, you need to be accompanied by a sponsor. This is very crucial, right? Where we've been talking a lot about catechesis as discipleship. And so this is built into the catechumenate process. So these are just some of the ways in which we have to be looking to the catechumenate as a model for what we do. And the catechumenate is very focused on the relationship of evangelization and catechesis. Um, and we'll be really digging into that more deeply, but we see that the catechumenate is proposing the gospel for belief. It's not assuming that, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a process that is meant to be receiving converts and strengthening their faith. So it's very intentionally employing a pedagogy of faith, bringing people to meet Jesus through a proclamation of the kerygma, but then deepening that faith catechetically. And so the gospel is always very present um, and doctrine is introduced to reinforce that. So it's a very beautiful process. As I said, it's meant to happen um, over the course of a couple of years, ideally. Um, and it's also a process of discernment. People should never be going through the stages unless it's clear that they are ready and that we are affirming them in that readiness. So I think the catechumenate can sometimes, unfortunately, in RCIA, be a process of going through the motions. Okay, we showed up and we had a couple of weeks of you know, inquiry, answering questions. Okay, now we're just gonna go into the, the catechumenate and okay, we've done that for four months. Now it's the right of election. Okay, so we're just gonna go through that process and then if you, if you do that, then you'll be baptized and confirmed at the Easter Vigil. Okay, we're done with the process. It's like, no, 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 no. Slow down, slow down. Inquiry should last as long as it needs to. This first stage, like let's go through each of these stages. Inquiry um, is the period when people are here, they're curious, they wanna learn more. There may be some difficulties that stand in the way and so we want to answer any questions. We want to give an initial proclamation of the kerygma, of the gospel. Um, sometimes people even, can even break this stage into pre-evangelization and evangelization. The pre-evangelization would just be like answering objections, clearing up misunderstandings, uh, maybe giving some uh, foundational philosophical principles about uh, being able to know uh, the truth that that God exists even through reason that there is a creator, that there is uh, principles of truth within us through the natural law. We can introduce some of these things to kind of provide this natural foundation. Pre-evangelization then goes into evangelization through the explicit proclamation of the kerygma, right? And just to refresh us, the kerygma is the proclamation that God has become man to save us from our sins. And he saved us by dying for us on the cross and rising from the dead to give us new life. And he's ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father as our King. And, and he guides and governs us from, the, from his throne in heaven. So this is this first stage of, of inquiry, and that should last as long as it needs to last. It can last through the entire year, it can go longer, people can keep coming back. Uh, and we just accompany people to the point where they have an initial faith. They should not continue into the catechumenate if they do not have an initial faith in God and faith in the church's teaching. It's not fully flushed out, and that's fine. It's not meant to be. But there has to be a sense in which, yes, I believe in God. I believe that he has become man. I believe that he has founded the church. That's what we're looking for 
in this initial stage, and we can't put limits upon it. And so this helps us in catechesis in general, because if someone is only at this initial stage of curiosity, uh, we can't assume then that they're ready to start learning the details of doctrine. We need to be answering their questions. We need to be accompanying them in this initial stage. And some people, even if they're initiated, might even still be at that phase. And so we should be able to recognize that and, and to help them to come to a stronger faith. So there is a right of reception into the catechumenate, this entrance into the catechumenate. And, and just like inquiry needs to last as long as it needs to for the individual, so does the catechumenate. It shouldn't be, well, whoever enters the catechumenate, well, in four or five months, they're going to the right of election. It's like, no, if they need to be instructed in the faith, uh, this should last for over a year. I mean, that's even what the church tells us, that ideally this should last through two years. And so this is where we're really helping people to come to know the faith. This is catechesis proper, right? So the first stage was pre-evangelization, evangelization. This stage is catechesis, where we're deepening that initial conversion, and we're helping people to come to an understanding of what we believe in the faith. And so this gets extended uh, in the catechesis of children, right? Children are, infants are baptized, and they're given the grace of God, they're given the beginnings of faith, um, and when, when children are being catechized, we're deepening the faith that they were given in baptism. We're helping it to become explicit and not just remaining implicit. And this goes on for years, right, as, as we're educating children. And we're helping them to prepare, you know, especially in second and third grade, to receive their other sacraments uh, of initiation. So this is similar to the catechumenate process. The catechumenate culminates then in the rite of election, uh, where as adults, people are making the choice. Election means choice. And ultimately, this is God's choice, and it's the choice of the church as well. So people are saying, yes, I believe, I want to be initiated, and it's a choice on behalf of the church as well, where we say, yes, we do think you are ready, and there needs to be discernment there. Um, whether this is part of RCIA, or whether this is also people preparing for the sacraments as children or adults outside of RCIA, where we say, yes, you have the disposition of being open to the grace of God. We, we recognize faith in you. We recognize that you are living a life in accord with the faith. If we see that people are living a life that contradicts the faith, we should say, you're not ready. I do want to just briefly clear up a misunderstanding too. When somebody enters into the catechumenate, that is actually the moment when they enter into the church and when they become Catholic. Uh, the uh, initiation that happens through the sacraments is the full reception into the church, where you're fully initiated. Uh, but it is important to recognize that someone is a member of the church already when they are a catechumen. Anyway, so just a little clarification there. So after the rite of election, there is an intentional period of time of preparation, where we call it purification and enlightenment. This is the very origins of Lent as people are getting ready to receive the sacraments. And Lent was extended to everyone in the church as a time of renewal, where we renew our baptismal promises at Easter. And so this is a time of fasting, of praying, of deepening this conversion. We have the scrutinies that are done at Mass. We also have the handing on of the Our Father in the Creed. Because in the early church, with that dis disciplina arcana, People were actually not taught about the sacraments. They were not taught the creed and the Our Father. So they were new. They were receiving these things for the first time. Uh, but today, as part of our CIA, it is a sign that they have uh, fully embraced the church and the creed. They're, they're being handed the creed, the traditio, the handing on of the creed, and then the Our Father as these key, even artifacts for catechesis that, that shape the catechism. They're saying, yes, I embrace these. I will memorize them. I'll be ready to practice and live them in my initiation. 
And so the initiation takes place with the reception of the sacraments at the Easter Vigil. Uh, and that's very significant because it's the Paschal Mystery, which is celebrated and culminates at the Easter Vigil, that they are entering into through the reception of the sacraments. That they are dying with Christ and rising with Him when they are baptized. They are receiving His body and blood in the Eucharist. They are receiving the Holy Spirit in confirmation. That they're entering into these great mysteries. And then mystagogy, I would say, is the part that never ends. Right? There is a uh, farther explanation of, of what they received at the Easter Vigil in mystagogy. And so mystagogy should continue on. I, I've seen a very effective mystagogy continue for at least a year explicitly so that we help people. And we're not just saying, okay, you're initiated, good luck, but really guiding them through that first year um, as Catholics. And I have said that mystagogy should continue for us throughout our life as Christians because we continue to receive the sacraments of confession uh, and the Eucharist. And we continue to live out our sacrament of service, especially through marriage for most of us. And so we have this ongoing mystagogy as we enter more deeply into our reception of the sacraments. And so all of us need ongoing catechesis to deepen the Christian life, to keep that spirit of conversion going within us throughout the course of our lives. And so this is our model for how we want people to be transformed and to enter more deeply into the life of God and into the sacraments through our catechesis. Uh, Monsignor Francis Kelly wrote a book, The Mystery We Proclaim, and within this book, he proposed uh, a catechetical method which I think generally follows the catechumenate even just for guiding us in one particular lesson. So there are many great catechetical methods out there, but I want to hold up Father uh, Kelly's method because of its connection, I think, to the catechumenate. And so he has a number of steps here in what he calls his ecclesial method that are just something good to keep in mind as we plan our own catechetical lessons. Preparation, uh, which he says is creating the right conditions and atmosphere so that you're getting ready for the lesson, you're praying, and you're creating the conditions for people to enter into what you're teaching. So he even says, you know, maybe you want to light candles in the classroom and, and create a holy atmosphere to put up images, maybe images related to what you're going to teach, uh, just creating a Catholic environment to make people receptive. The proclamation. So you begin your teaching with something like evangelization where you are giving a witness to your core message and, and you're proclaiming it for someone to respond in faith. I think that is crucial. We should never be leaving evangelization behind. We should always be teaching with, that, with this idea that I am proclaiming the message of God for people to believe in and to receive into their own lives. Uh, then we have the explanation. So catechesis follows upon evangelization, where we're explaining what we proclaimed in more detail, leading people to a deeper understanding. And here we can, as we've been discussing before, right, use stories and examples uh, to show how the message uh, is explained and lived in more detail, uh, concretely even. And then we have the application. I think this is so important, important in our teaching. So we give the message, but what do you do with that message? How do you live that message? How do you respond to that? And I think many times we forget about that. So we just give this great message and say, okay, see you next week. Has it changed anybody? Right? Do people know what to do with what you've given them? So this application helps the person to respond and to help the message to bear fruit in their lives. Don't forget that. And then finally, celebration, where we pray through the message and we want to encounter God. Uh, and this is really where it becomes real for us, as we've discussed. And, and this helps us to come into the contact with the goal of catechesis, this union with God, communion with Jesus, encountering Him, uh, uh, being transformed by Him. 
So I think we, we get many aspects here. We have this progression, this movement from evangelization to catechesis to hopefully conversion. We have prayer and this liturgical element here. So many key aspects of the catechumenate are brought into this very simple step-by-step -step method of catechizing. So this is just something I put forward um, as something to consider. I also want to mention uh, catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Now, I, when I talk to people about that particular method, some people are hesitant because it has very particular and extensive training, and it also requires creating an, an atrium. It's based on the Montessori method. Um, and so there's a bit of an investment both in time and also getting the right resource and, and environment set up for it. But I do want to point it out because there's a couple of elements that I think also follow from the divine pedagogy, where there's very much an attention to the sacramental experience um, of catechesis, where there's a great use of signs and helping people, the children in particular, to go through this process of discovery and meeting God through catechesis. So there's a lot of good principles there. And Sophia Cavaletti, who was one of the pioneers of this method, um, has a couple of books called The Religious Potential of the Child, right? There, there's one that, that begins with that, and it's for younger children. And then she has a follow-up volume that continues her method uh, into children uh, who are a little bit older. So I just point that out as another good method to consider, and even just to take insights from and incorporate uh, into what you're doing if you're, if you're not able to embrace that method wholesale. And so our particular pedagogy Right, our pedagogy of faith, our pedagogy of the church, that's our way of teaching, is ordered towards bringing people to faith. Just like the catechumenate, right? it's ordered towards conversion, it's ordered toward meeting God through initiation and the sacraments. So everything that we do uh, should be uh, ordered towards helping people to meet God in faith, to encounter Him. And so this is why we teach doctrine, to bring people to this encounter, uh, to come to faith and to understand their faith. Uh, some people, as we looked at when we talked about the catechism, say that we don't need doctrine. The reason why we need to teach doctrine is that we need to understand God. We need to know Him. We can never understand Him perfectly, right? But we need to know Him. We need to know who He is in order to love Him and to, to enter into a relationship with him. You can't have a relationship and friendship with somebody you don't know exists, and you don't even know who they are. So you have to know who anyone is to have a relationship with him. And so we teach doctrine to help people to encounter God and to know him. Part of this pedagogy of faith is handing on what we have received. Um, I, I love this line in Matthew's Gospel of Jesus, just like we read in Luke, uh, he sends the disciples out to preach the kingdom, and he says, give freely what you have received freely. And some translations say, give as a gift what you have received as a gift. Right? God has given his life to us freely as a gift. We have not earned it. He gives it to us. And we've received it through the ministry of others. Uh, other people have helped us to meet God. Our parents, other catechists, priests, religious, our friends, they've all helped us to receive this gift that comes to us from God. And so it's very beautiful to think of catechesis as passing on this gift that has come to us. We want other people to meet God and to receive His grace just as we have. Um, and so Catechesis has echoed down to us through the ages, and as I've said before, we're part of this chain of passing on the gift of God. What are we seeking to do as we're teaching as well? Uh, and this is more of the evangelical nature of it. Even as we're teaching catechesis, we're teaching doctrine, we're sharing the good news of God's salvation, and we're helping people to become happy in and through God. Um, we saw this in our reading from the Catechism when it was talking about happiness. Riches and wealth right, will not make people happy. Pleasure will not make people happy. The latest technology will not make people happy. They, those things might distract us, but in the end, these things leave us 
empty because they don't fulfill our deepest longings and our deepest needs. And so we are performing such a great work of love by helping people to meet God. He is the only one who can truly make us happy. He's the only one who will never exhaust, who will never leave us disappointed even as we go through difficulties, right? As we go through the many difficulties in this valley of tears, God will be there with us. He will see us through and he will last forever and we will never even exhaust his goodness through all eternity. And so we try to uh, make the best use of good pedagogy, that is good teaching, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what good pedagogy looks like, especially, you know, with our laws of the teacher, which we're going to turn to in a minute here. But I just want to come back to the point, I think in almost every single Lexio we've done, it's referred to the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, without the Holy Spirit, everything that we do will not bear fruit. It will not be effective because catechesis, once again, is a spiritual and supernatural work. It's entering into the supernatural life of God. And so we do what we can as a matchmaker <laughs> to help people to fall in love with God and to meet God. But the Holy Spirit actually enters into the hearts of the ones we're catechizing, and he helps them to come to faith. There's nothing that we can do to make people come to faith. Uh, we just, you know, basically create the conditions. We create the opportunity, and the Holy Spirit brings the seed uh, to take root in the soil and to bear fruit. He does that himself in people's hearts, and this is part of the reason why our pedagogy has to be one of prayer. But nonetheless, we do want to be effective teachers. And so we're going to look just briefly on page 39 of the book at these laws of the seven laws of teaching. Um, and these laws uh, were developed actually by the, the first president of the University of Illinois, but he was also a Sunday school teacher. So he, he was a very accomplished uh, university uh, president and educator, but he, he was very attentive to just the way that we uh, teach people in the faith as well. And so the first law is the law of the teacher. That is, the teacher has to know what they're teaching. And so we, every time we go into the classroom, we should have a clear goal. Okay, this week, I would like my students to know this, and therefore, I must know this first. And so that's the key thing, is preparing each lesson to make sure we actually know what we're talking about. Uh, the law of the student is the second law, that the student must be active and engaged in the lesson. Right? We do not want the kids to be passive, or adults, or anyone. Right? We want them to care about what we're teaching, and to get involved in discussion, and learning about it, and expressing interest, and seeing how it relates to their own lives. The third law is the law of the language. And so our language has to be clear. Uh, so we want simple, clear language that people can understand at an age-appropriate level. We want clear explanations so that if, if you use a kind of Catholic term or theological term, uh, never assume that people understand it, but explain it uh, and why it's relevant. Uh, the law of the lesson and so uh, that, uh, this law is basically saying we want to build our teaching up by natural steps. You never just want to jump ahead, uh, but we want to build on the experiences of the students that they've already had um, and continue to progress naturally. This is like the divine pedagogy. is like the catechumenate. The law of the teaching process. Uh, this is very similar to what we talked about, but it's, we want to use discussion and activities um, to have the teaching process be one that engages teacher and student together in a common process of entering into the realities that we are studying. And then the law of review, that we always want to come back through what we've taught and make sure that it's understood, review the essential points, come back to them. It's not enough to introduce an important point once. 
and we want to come back, reinforce it, make sure it's clear, and if it's not clear, introduce it again. Uh, so these uh, laws are important, and they also help us to reinforce the sacramental method, uh, which is uh, expressing spiritual realities through our experiences, through visible signs, through our words. Everything that we do is to make present and real to the students uh, the spiritual realities that come to us from God that we are communicating to those we're catechizing. We're going to look at some more particular helpful points for preparing to uh, catechize effectively by preparing a lesson. But before we do that, uh, we're going to have a discussion uh, of these points. So we're going to pause uh, here once again. Uh, we're going to talk through these particular questions. Have you had any experience with the baptismal catechumenate? Uh, particularly, have you helped out with RCIA? Have you gone through RCIA? Um, I've worked with a lot of catechists who are converts, and that gives them uh, a really great edge in a way because they know what it's like to come to faith. And, and, and sometimes they can be very zealous for bringing others through this. Um, if with your helping out of RCIA or going through it, did you see that the stages help to facilitate conversion? Did the process actually accomplish what it intended? And if you work in RCIA now, are there ways that you can make it even more effective at doing that? What do you think of Father Kelly's, Monsignor Kelly's approach to catechesis? Do you see that this method you know, is a helpful enactment of the divine pedagogy or the baptismal catechumenate? Do you think it could work for you in your own teaching? Are there other methods that you've found effective? Right? There are other helpful methods as well. Um, how can you incorporate prayer more into your teaching to point to the Holy Spirit as the one who makes catechesis effective? Um, as a group, discuss the seven laws of teaching. Is there anything there that you'd like to add? Any other laws that you think are missing? Or do you think these describe the process of learning pretty well? Um, do you have a sense of the urgency of catechesis, just the, the great need um, that there is to bring people to happiness by this encounter with God. Uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes catechesis can be somewhat of an afterthought um, in our parishes. So these are some points just to, to talk through catechetical methods. Feel free to also uh, include any other questions that you think are important uh, for discussing uh, how to catechize effectively. So a practical point in considering our methodology is how to prepare a lesson for a catechetical session. Uh, Gilbert Hyatt, in his book, The Art of Teaching, so very similar to our Art of Catechesis, says essentially that we need to make sure that we're preparing well, that we communicate clearly, and then that we check what we taught to make sure that the students are getting it. So we want to keep these three things in mind when we're preparing our lesson, right? We do our preparation, we make sure that we're ready to communicate the material clearly, and then that we're checking that the students are getting it. Um, we need, I think, before each lesson, at least a short period of study and preparation. Uh, if you're teaching something for the first time, it may be a little bit longer. So you wanna look at the actual text, if you're using a text, make sure that you understand everything clearly, uh, you, you can be consulting the, the two major sources of catechesis that we've been talking about, the Bible and the catechism. Keep them handy. Um, and then ask questions if you need to. Uh, you know, email your DRE. Uh, contact, you know, a fellow catechist, a pastor, family member, if, if you know that they're knowledgeable in the faith. And just make sure that you're ready to go and, and maybe even anticipate any questions that you might be asked. Uh, as well. That, that can also be helpful to think, okay, if a student asks me this, you know, how would I answer that? As you're doing your preparations, it's important also to make a goal and to say, okay, there's a lot of things that are in the lesson this week, but if I only did one thing this week, what would it be? What's the most important point that I want to make sure that I communicate that? There's some other things that, okay, if I have time, I'll get to them. 
Um, but to have this priority, I think, uh, is very helpful. And it helps you to organize the material as well, to say, this is the heart of the lesson. This is what matters most. Um, and it should be, of course, uh, the key essential teaching. And then to make a brief outline uh, surrounding that. Uh, okay, are we going to begin with a prayer? What's that prayer going to look like? Um, is there an activity to kind of lead into the core material, or do I just want to begin right away with some kind of proclamation, as we saw with Monsignor Kelly? Um, what are the different particular points? How do I want to communicate them? How am I going to review? Sometimes the activity can even be a way to review. I want to make a note about um, the activities as well, because it's very important to get people active and involved, uh, to get a discussion going. Uh, one of the things that you, know, you hear criticized very often in catechesis um, is activities that really are wasting time and that they don't reinforce the lesson material. It's just kind of a way to say, well, you know, eight-year-olds, they like to do this, at this particular activity, so we'll just have them do that. Well, activities are great, but make sure that they're actually related to the content, that they're reinforcing the content and reviewing the content, and are opportunities also for discussion. Well, tell me about what you did on that paper. Let's talk about that. It can, it can be very fruitful, but as I said, it can also be a waste. So as you're planning the lesson, make sure about that. It's also important to make sure that People know why you're teaching the current material. Why are we learning about this point? Is it just for the heck of it? Is it just something good to know? Or does this actually relate to my own faith? Does this relate to my life in any way? It's good to make that explicit. Um, and as we saw even in um, Monsignor Kelly's method, right, to, to help people through the response to the material. Okay, here's the point we're trying to make. This is what we do now. And, and I've even su made suggestions to say, this week when you go home, I want you to say this prayer as a family. Or I want you to help someone in this particular way. Or I want you to practice this virtue this coming week. Help make that extension of the lesson into the week be beyond and then circle back to it and say, well, how did that go this week? How did it go, uh, you know, practicing patience, you know, with one of your siblings or, or whatever it is. Another important element is classroom management. And I have a little section on this in the book. I want to point to the Bosco method because St. Uh, John Bosco is one of the greatest catechists um, in the church's history. He was known particularly for working with boys uh, who really needed particular help, and so he formed schools that would teach boys not only about the faith, but, but also how to prepare for their careers. Um, and one of the most important things that he said was that you represent God to the children. That is, you are that witness, you are that role model, and so they will look to you as a representation of the faith. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but if you push people away, they might just walk. And I know this for a fact that my aunt stopped going to CCD uh, because somebody said something uh, to her that was wrong and was offensive. And she said, I'm not going back anymore. And so there is a great responsibility here, uh, of particularly, as St. John Bosco said, to show love to the children more than anything else. And so on pages 46 and 47, he gives us some pointers. Act like a caring father. Doesn't mean, I mean, even if you're not a man, right? You represent God the Father, right? You want to show God's love uh, to them. He says, you will obtain anything from your children if they realize that you are seeking their own good so that you are a loving person to them. Always be gentle and prudent, Allow for the thoughtlessness of youth and be alert for hidden motives. If somebody's acting out, a lot of times there's a reason for that. Can you help get at that with some of the other people in the parish, uh, working with the parents, and, and realize what's going on here? Speak kindly, even when 
somebody's not being kind to you. Give timely advice and correct often, not in a way that, that lashes out, but in a way that encourages people towards good behavior. Um, and John Paul specifically said that this method is based on God's own method of teaching, his pedagogy of being patient and leading us towards the truth uh, in, a, in a gradual way. Now, if there's serious problems that come up, right, it's, it's good to address that with the student in a kind and patient, patient way. If it's serious, you want to be getting your DRE involved and, and working with the DRE to, to talk to uh, the parents. It's also very helpful to, be a, to have accountability, to have very clear guidelines. So in my class, right, uh, if you want to talk, you raise your hand, right? And if, if someone does this, right, this is what will happen, you know? And so everybody understands uh, what the sort of limits are in the classroom and what's expected of them. So it's just good to, to be very clear with what you expect and to ask for help uh, when you need it. So this is just giving us some pointers of how we can teach like God and how we can really have a pedagogy of faith that brings people to an encounter with God through our witness, through our teaching, uh, through our prayer uh, and mentorship of those we're working with. So let's end uh, once again with a glory be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.